I'll introduce myself. My name is Kyle Blocker. I'm a, a Go lover like everyone else here. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to classify moves as uh, sente, gote, or ambiguous based off of some mathematics. Uh, but I'm specifically trying to target uh, people who aren't necessarily so interested in math. So I'm trying to make this subject amenable to everyone. Because um, if you're not interested in math and some, some guy tries to come up and talk to you about Go and starts write, writing numbers down, you're just like, ah, I don't want to talk about it. But So anyway, please, uh, I'm trying intentionally to make this uh, a fun and un understandable. Uh, so this, I'm going to teach you a, a, a different kind of counting first uh, in order to show you how to classify these, uh, an arbitrary move as, as sente or gote. And it's called uh, mei counting. Perhaps a little misnomer, um, but we'll get into that. Um, so I'll show you how to do that, and then we'll uh, talk about how to make it a lot easier to actually look at a whole position by drawing the position out as a tree. And so you've seen, if you've been to, uh, I think, a couple of the computer presentations that they actually talked about uh, using game trees to, um, to evaluate a position, well, I tried to actually include the position in the tree, so maybe we can see in full detail what the actual tree means. Um, and then we'll attach values to each of the positions within the tree. And then I'll quickly sort of go over, well, maybe I won't because it's been gone over, uh, but I'll go over some related work that's actually using this kind of counting. Uh, this counting also stems from combinatorics, so they use this kind of counting uh, um, sort of as a foundation for some related work that's been done in the last 20 years. Um, okay, so again, I very much like interactive talks, so if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt and ask. And come up to the mic or I'll repeat you. Uh, some conventions, black scores when they're displayed on the board are positive, and white scores are negative. Um, so, so we don't have to um, prepend the score with black or white. Uh, I will sometimes say the word temperature, which roughly means the largest play in the entire board at, the, at, at this moment. And um, also, uh, the word count means the, the estimated or average so score of the current position that we're looking at. Okay, so that will be more clear here in a second. So, unfortunately, we have to learn how to count again. So, uh, uh, maybe you've already learned how to count. And, and of course, the way that I'm showing to count in this presentation is completely not how the professionals do it. Every time I've shown this to a professional Go player, they're like, what the heck are you talking about? I don't count like that. Uh, but this counting method was actually come up with by a Japanese man some, like, I think it was 50 years ago. And I apologize, I'm very embarrassed for not having the name, but, uh, but uh, it was invented there. Um, and uh, it's, it's more accurate, but it may not be as uh, natural. So, in traditional go counting, we use the swing most of the time to talk about how much a point, uh, a move is worth. So if white plays there and it could get five points, and black plays there, it could get seven points, then we say, oh, that move is worth 12 points. And then we have a rule of thumb that says, oh, if the move is gote, divide it in half. So it's worth six. Okay, something like this. That's sort of how we learn to count. In, uh, because it's easy, it's fast, and we don't have to think too much about the moves that follow. But actually, follow-ups are very important. And so this method I'm showing you actually includes, of course, the entire tree. So it's going to consider all of the follow-up moves. Uh, so in traditional counting, how much is a move at A, uh, or at the, at, the, yeah, at the position A worth? And the first diagram is the starting position. And the, the other two diagrams is showing you what happens if black or white plays there. Yeah, it's worth two. Okay, and we know this because uh, we have we create this little game it's in Common Turks. It's called a game in the curly braces, and um, and we put the black score on the left and the white score on the right. And uh, if black moves there, we say it moves to two, and if white plays there, we say it moves to zero. And so it's worth two points for anybody that plays there. Okay, but that number is not, um, not so good, actually. So um, it's great for a quick and dirty anal uh, analysis of what you're looking at, but it's not so useful when you're trying to 
take all of the numbers everywhere on the board, all of these different move values, and compose them together to some meaningful way of saying, okay, maybe you could compose them together and say, how much is this player behind by looking at all of the different positions and all of the possible moves that we have? Um, so we're going to change it just a little bit. So we're going to use MEI counting instead of Dairy counting, which was what we just used. And so instead of just saying the swing value, what we're going to, what we're going to count instead is the average amount gained when you play there. Okay, so, um, so consider before the, it was worth two points, right? Because black has two when they play there and white has zero. So what's the average number for the position right now? Oops, and I got those, I got those out of order. So I guess, yeah, this is the starting one. This is black and this, and this is white. So this is worth two and this is worth zero. So how much, what's the count of this position right now? One. And so if black plays there, they're going to gain how many points above the average? One above. And how about white? Okay. So this move is actually worth one point. Because right now, black has one point on average. Right now, before anybody moves. When somebody moves, we're going to move that value towards one extreme or the other extreme. But as of right now, the value of that position or the count of that position is one. So actually, if we think of it in that terms, how much you gain on average by playing there, we can take all of the estimated values of positions like these, sum them up, and then that's the amount that a given player is ahead or behind in the entire board. So you talk about half points. Oh, uh, what's the question? Uh, so it's not mean you talk about half points or possibly. Uh, the question is whether we have a half, half point moves or not. Oh, oh, in the middle case, uh, if one, uh, if black can gain only one and white may get nothing, it means uh, uh, the position of the middle is a half point. That's is correct. That right? Yes, okay. that's correct. And in fact, there's an even smaller one. Yeah. There's an even smaller one, right? Um, and it also has a terrible name. So me, I counting is a, has a, is a kind of bad name and also the the, um, you'll find that this position that is worth even less than a half also has a bad name. So, uh, so I love interactivity, so I've given four problems here, and so we're going to do them together, okay? And I apologize for the not live audience, but you have to suffer through our, our um, playing together. So uh, I think I got the orders right here. Uh, this is the... Uh, so that, uh, the leftmost position is the starting position, and then the middle one is if black plays there, and the right one is if white plays there. So someone, as aside from this gentleman, please tell me how much, uh, what's the uh, value of a move played? Yes. Half point. Half point, very good. And then what is the, uh, what's the count of the original position? I'm not sure what that means. Okay, so... The count, I'll give you a hint, the count of the rightmost one, the white one, is zero. And the count of the middle one, where black plays, is one. Right, that's the, original position is a half. the count of the original position is a half. Very good. Okay, so the count of the original position is one, or the count of black plays there is one. So count, is the count of the original position and the value of the position the same thing? No. They just are coincidentally the same thing. I should, have, I should have provided a better example where actually, you know, maybe black has another point on the board. In which case, if black had another point in this position, the count would be one and a half, and then black could move to two and white could move to one, say. Okay, so the count is a half and the move is also worth a half. Okay, so next problem, uh, we'll just make this one longer. Uh, so what is a move at A worth? Okay. And black can move to um, some number of points here. Can somebody say what that is? Two. 
Okay, and how about white over here? What can white move to? I'll give you a hint. We've already solved this problem. Half. Who said half? <laughs> Who said half? Why is it a half? We just did that problem. Yeah, up here. This is worth a half a point, right? So if we can find this on the Go board somewhere, we know that this is worth a half a point for black. So we found this position. It's right there. So we know that that position is worth a half a point for black. The position is worth a half. White can make nothing, right? It's too. It's worth a half because black. It's worth a half a point on average, because black could play there and make a point, or white could play there and black make zero points. Therefore, it's worth half a point on average. That position. This one and this one. If I could draw a giant equal sign between these two, I would. Yeah. Okay, those are the same. But we haven't solved the first. We haven't solved the question. What's the first one worth? This one. Yes, we have not solved this question. It just depends who plays next. What's just, we're just finding the, the question was it depends on who plays with next. Actually, it doesn't. We're finding what this position is worth right now before anybody plays. The average value of this uh, average value of this position. One and a quarter. Uh, yes, very good. Okay, so the count of this position is one and a quarter. And either player can move there to gain three quarters of a point in their favor. So you're always looking at what the, what the value of the next person playing one move is in order to determine what the value of the position is. So the question was whether were we always looking at whether one extra move is determining what the value of the current position is. Yes, with an asterisk. OK, so yes, if it's double gote. Uh, okay. It changes when we talk about sente. And it also may change when we talk about co. <laughs> OK, any questions about this slide? OK, we're not done doing problems, so we're going to do another one, another two, OK? So this is the infamous half point co, which I'm going to give you a big hint right now. It's not worth half a point. Okay, again, here is the original problem. What's the value of a move played at A? Okay, black has to play two moves in order to resolve the co, right? Black has to play the first move to take and the second move to fill. And white only has to play one move to fill. Okay, so let's start by the easiest thing we can do is start at the bottom and work our way up. So what's the value of white filling? Zero. OK, zero. And what's the value of black playing these two moves together? Zero. One point, because we captured the co-stone. OK? Now, who wants, who wants some, a big gold star for figuring out how much it's worth right here? One third? Why is it one third? But okay, try to try to explain a little bit more then. Is that an intuitive guess that it's one third? Are you talking about the count or the value of a move? Um, I guess that would be the count. Okay. So claim here that the count is one third of a point. Anybody else agree with him? No. A quarter. Okay, so we have a third, we have a quarter. Anybody else? We have a third going on a third, we have a quarter going on a quarter. Going a third. Okay. <laughs> Two thirds. It's worth a half, but you've got to play an extra move, so I don't know what that means. Why is it worth a half? Well, because it's the same as before, right? Because it's worth one to black and nothing to white. Okay, so if we average those two strictly together, then we got a half a point. Yes. Except that black has to play two moves to get there, and white has to play one move to get there. Very good. But I don't know what that means. Okay, so how many moves total? In the original examples, how many moves did we have total for getting to one extreme or the other? One, one each. Added together, we get two moves. So how about this one? Two moves plus one is three moves. For the total number of, the total moves, number of moves that are uh, the, dis the, the um, 
this dis disparity between the, the um, one player going to the, all the way to a ground position to resolve, to resolve, and then the other player has to go to their ground position. It's three moves. And how many points can we gain in those three moves? One point total. So one divided by three is one third. Very good. I'm sorry, you were saying the disparity is the number of moves between the two outcomes is the difference of three? Three. Not the difference, the sum. The sum, the, the sum. Because black has to play two more moves in the start position to get to one point for black. And white has to get play a move to get to one to no points for anybody. And so that's two moves for black versus one move for white. So we have to add them together to get the total number of difference moves. Yes, no so question. If, on a more complex example, if, if black sequence was six moves and white was eight moves to finish? Then we'd have to divide everything by four. Yes. So the question was, the question was uh, if we had a, a more complicated example where if white has to play six moves in a row to get to our ground result and black has to play eight moves in a row to get to his ground result, then yes, we take the difference between the two scores of white and black and divide it by 14. And that's the average value of, a, a, uh, with the caveat of saying that if each move in that s those sequences were all equal. So say we had a 13 step co, if you know what that is. Right? It takes 13 moves to resolve a co, you imagine some you know, wrong, ridiculous thing. Then each value, um, each move in that co would then be worth one 14th of the entire thing. Uh, maybe 12 step co, sorry, off by one error. Yeah, three moves for a one, three moves for a one step co, so 12 moves, 14 moves for a 12 step co. Good question. So this comes up normally only in co's. Um, there is one other time in when we use a different divisor, um, and that'll come up in a second. But yes, very good, so one point here for black, no points for white, over three moves means, okay? Right now, the position is worth one third of a point for black. Black can move once to make it worth two thirds of a point for black, and black can move it again to make one point for black. So each value, each, each, each move is worth one third of a point. Okay, good. Any questions about co? Okay, this is the easiest co I can give, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a harder co. So let's start by counting the easy, easy part, right? How much, how many points, what's this, the count of this position here? Two for white. I don't understand that. It's actually negative two, right? Negative two. The count is negative two. And what's the count uh, here? Thirteen, because twelve points here plus the capture. Okay. Two here, negative two here and thirteen here. Add them together, and we get. 15 divided by 15, I'm sorry, 15, 8, 4, 5, 10, 12. Plus the capture. 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, plus that stone. Oh, that one, that one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Forgot about that one. <clears throat> so 15 point swing, and it takes three moves to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. So each move on average makes five points. So now for simple codes, I have actually given you enough tools to go and look at a position like this and be clear-headed about codes and say, I need to find a move that I could make 10 points in two moves, say. That means that if I play this move and then they resolve the co and I play the second move to make 10 points, I've just come out equal. Because a move in the, move in the co is worth five points. Yes? Uh, you said you could divide by three? Divide by three, yes, because Which number? The, the, um, this number minus this number. 
13 minus negative 2, so we get 15. That's, this, that's how you find the swing between two positions. So uh, two points for white is negative two points for black, right? So we go from 13 to negative two. That's a total difference of 15 points. Because white can go all the way to two points for white, and black can go all the way to 13 points for black. So there's 15 points up for grabs in this position. OK. So you said each move is worth five points. Is that the case, or is that just the average? That is the case. So they are actually each worth five points? That's, that's correct. Each move in this co is worth five points. Now again, this is a co that there's no consequence to winning the co other than the local result of points here. That's why you may hear uh, strong players when they say, when uh, maybe you've looked at a professional game record in which, uh, if you're familiar uh, with uh, you know, a, a uh, shimari in the corner, and the professional will play a probe, and then the outcome of the probe may result in one move being able to make a living group in the corner or maybe make a co. All of a sudden, the professional plays away. Why do they play away? Because there's no global consequence to them playing there again. So the move is only worth maybe five points. But other moves may be worth eight points. So it's just a probe, even though I could make a living group here. And moves in the middle game are worth about Comey or more. It could be even more if there's something urgent going on, right? So, so that can explain to you why professionals would make a probe and then leave the Aji behind and not finish and making a group living because it's not worth paying the, my opponent to get first move elsewhere. It's not worth enough. Okay? Okay, so hopefully that sort of analysis convinced you. Now this is, this is a, um, <clears throat> again, this is a, this is, you can actually do this in your games. And I challenge you to try to take this analysis and try to do it in your games. You know, bravo. Maybe you'd be totally wrong, but at least you try to do it. <laughs> but say I have this position. I, let's say we could add all four positions on this board. They all existed, right? I can't, I can't back up here, but the other ones are worth, let's see, plus a half. Um, let's go back to the previous slide. Now, I'm, which direction? I only have one button on here. Just go back into the two slides ago. Keep going. Right there. OK, so we have a half a point and 1.25. It's 1.75 plus a third is uh, uh, 2.08 um, 2 plus 3. It's 5.08. So right now, if we had a board with just those four positions on, black is winning by just over five points. on average. Okay, any questions? Yes. So you say the pros don't count this way? No. Uh, pros but would they count. come up with the same result? Yes. They would say they're ahead by five Pros points. are godly figures that mere mortals like ourselves do not even you know, come close to being able to aspire to be like them. So. They have their own counting methods in which, yes, they count accurately. I've heard, the, I've heard the professionals can count accurately to within about one-sixth of a point. And they would agree with all of these numbers? Uh, they would not necessarily agree with the method, right. but I'd hope they would agree with the same sort of... With the result. Yeah. Maybe the, maybe the scale of the numbers is off. Maybe all of my numbers are half the size of theirs. But the... the uh, the, the relative, relative scale of how important these moves are to play and what order is off. Yeah. So all of these moves I've shown you are actually double gote in some sense, pretty much. So our calculations are easy. No, you, your hand came up and another man's can, hand came up at the same uh, time. In Chinese way of counting, is that the numbers differ? Yes, the number would be different if Chinese accounting, because we also have to count for playing the stone on the board. But in general, it's just adding one, because the count of the position may be different, because we have to add all of the stones too. But the value of a move is just add one to all the value of the moves, um, because we count the stone plus the move. Um, so 
the value of black's finishing move, black's second move, is plus 13, right? Or, or, this one? or the move is worth five overall. Yes. The, but then what about his first move? It is also worth five. So the first move is worth five, and then filling is worth five. Every move in this co is worth five. That I don't get. Cool. <laughs> Oh, to, for pros posterity, uh, let me try to explain it one more time. That's okay. This is a good question. There are a total of three moves, and right now, right now in this co, right, this position is unsettled. Right now in this co, white needs to play one more move in order to make two points. Black needs to play two more moves in order to make. Oops, wrong. Black needs to play two more moves in order to make thirteen points. So if you accept as gospel that each move is worth five points, take this plus three and take five points, multiply them by two, we're going to get 13. Take this move being worth five points, take this plus three, subtract five, and you're going to get minus two. So it's yes. always true or only in double gote where the division just tells you what each move is worth? Will that change once it's not double gote? Yes, the okay. value of the move will change uh, when we enter Yusente, yes. And it will change. You can imagine it changing, too, if we have, like, gote no sente, where we have a gote play with a sente follow-up, or a sente play with a gote follow-up. Yes? Hi. Uh, I am not a math person, and I'm a, a Me real, neither. Okay, I'm <laughs> a real novice, um, so I'm not exactly sure if I'm grasping this, but can you explain something in your title? Can you, with a basic non-math person, can you explain what combinatorial game theory is? Probably not, but I'll give it a try. Uh, okay. Um, well, game theory is game theory is uh, you know from I believe from John Nash, right? Um, game theory is invented several you know several decades ago, and it talks about trying to formalize the, the decisions that we make. Right. So it's decision making under conditions of uncertainty, or is that not game theory? Uh, Yes, there is a, an aspect of uncertainty, but here our uncertainty is 50%, because it's uncertain whether black or white will get to play a position. So 50% of the time, black will play it. 50% of the time, white will play it, okay. all else being equal. OK. So what is, combina what is the combinatorial combinatorics, related to? Combinatorics is the, uh, just the, ability, the study of taking uh, different outcomes and, and figuring out what's going to happen. On, okay. On, either outcome. Okay, so it, it, combinatorial is looking at possible outcomes. It has nothing to do with values or counting or points or anything. Well, it may, yes, but in, and in fact, most of the time it does. In terms uh, of one strategy, so you're yes. looking at various combinations of plays. Yes, so in, I mean, for an example, you could have a giant tree and at the outcome you just have win or loss mm -hmm. at the bottom. And in fact, in a very abstract level, that, that's what a go game is. We have a giant tree of possibilities at the end of the giant tree. We don't have a point value. We have win or loss. Right, right. You're not counting points the way you are right. on bridge. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, it's not like that. Yes, very good, yes. Okay, so I have about 10 minutes or so. So I really want to get across this concept of sente because then you can see what sente is all about and then understand how to classify moves a certain way. So uh, there's a proverb that says sente gains nothing. And in fact, I agree with this proverb. Because if you have sente, you should count it as already yours. And if you didn't get it, either something bad happened along the way to allow your opponent to take the sente away somehow. Uh, by bad, I will not go into what I mean by bad, but you can imagine. Um, not being a good player is not an excuse. and. Uh, uh, but we're already. But if a move is sente, then you can play it at any time. That's what we're taught, right? Well, at any time, again with an asterisk. But if the timing is good, then you should be able to play the sente move and and cash in the points when you play the sente move. So um, so here, in we're going to assume that there are an infinite number of board condition positions. So you have the opportunity to play in any number of infinite position you want any time. So the timing will always be right for you to at, at some point, the timing will be right for you to play that sente move and cash in. So in the theory, theoretical sense, we can cash in on that move at the proper time. So we're going to count a move of sente as belonging to the person who has the sente privilege. Um, so the mi value of the play then becomes the value of the other player just so happening to play the reverse sente play. 
because in some sense that's taken away your sente and gained more above the average. The average expected value is you actually playing the sente play. Okay, and the math actually holds that out. Because what is a sente play? You play, somebody follows. The, number, the difference in number of moves is zero. But the reverse sente play, you play, the other person doesn't follow. So the total number of different moves is just one. So it's just the value of playing the reverse sente play. Okay, so on the left diagram here, we have a, a gote play. Okay, we already solved this problem. We determined the, the, the count of this position to be uh, one and a quarter, and the value of playing here to be three quarters. And, um, um, and if you play at A on the left, then you have this follow-up play at B, um, but it's only worth half a point. So there might be some move in between three quarters of a point and half a point. So playing at three quarters of a point is gote because your opponent doesn't have to follow because if you're gonna play this three quarter of a point and we're assuming that you're playing the best move you possibly can, three quarters of a point is the largest move on the board. Otherwise, you wouldn't have played there. You would have played somewhere else. So your opponent's not gonna follow you because the largest move on the board might be greater than a half a point and not quite three quarters of a point yet. Okay, so this move at A is gote because the point is decreasing. Okay, but here, sente, this move at A, let's just call it three quarters of a point. Okay, my follow-up move at B scores me a heck of a lot more than half a point. Right? Scores me a heck of a lot more. So, this is at least a quarter of a point. It's not, it's not this, right? Two points on average, I go to this, is like I'm gaining like 21 points in two moves. Okay? I went from three quarters to 10 and a half. So it's likely, so what that means is, is if you imagine all the possible moves in the game, the best one is right now three quarters. You play it. Now you've uncovered this 10 and a half point move for the other player. Of course they're gonna play it because that's the best move. So that's the sente play. The value increased, it just increased the temperature of the board from three quarters to 10 and a half. So, so you're going to play the 10 and a half move. So therefore, you play it, and the other player is going to respond. Um, so therefore, playing at A is actually worth one point. And um, let's see if I have it. Oh, darn. I actually used the wrong diagram here, so I'm going to... Can we back up another slide? Okay, so we'll just use, we'll use this board as an example. If black plays at A for a reverse sente, how many points does black make? One, two, three. We make the point at B and everything to the left of B, so black makes three points. If white plays the sente play at A, black is forced to block. And that exchange was free. Both players played a move, so it's free. Okay? How many points does black have after that exchange? Two. So playing at A is worth one point. Because black can play there and play to three, or white can cash it in at some point when they're supposed to and play to make black have two. Okay, the reason why we make, make this reverse sente so important is because um, Go doesn't have an infinite number of board positions. It has a finite number, it has a discrete number. And so it may happen, and it does in fact, right? You have the opportunity to play reverse sente plays all the time. Because this play isn't sente all the time. You could be at all or nothing co going on that's worth 40 points somewhere else on the board. And white ended it. All of a sudden, the best play is for black to stop this reverse sente. So black gets to play it. So there is opportunities to play a reverse sente play. So that's why we consider this, this value. But most of the time, on average, you're going to get to play. And actually using this method, I don't show it here, but using this method, you can actually calculate between what range of values the play is sente. Uh, so the diagrams are wrong, but this is supposed to be the position of the tree. Oh, no, this one is not wrong. This one's right. This was the one we did before. Okay, so we can show this, uh, um, we can show this as a tree. Uh, so this is the start position. And if we go to the left and play the black move and get two, we go to the right, we get the white one, we get half. How do we figure out a half? Well, we continue going down. If we play black after that white move, we get one. 
And if we get uh, play white, af white after again, after that black move, we get zero. So then we just take these two values and average them and assign that number to this next node up on the tree and do it again. And then we can write out here what the value of playing at each level of the tree is. So right here, it's worth a half a point. And here, it's worth three quarters of a point. So what does that mean? It means that right here, we can look at the tree and go down the tree and see that the values are decreasing. This is called a stable tree because you can play, at the, it, it makes sense, right? You, you play at the top and the value is worth the most. And then, and then the next level down, the value is worth less. So it would make sense possibly for white to be able to play here. But as we said in the Sente example, it doesn't make sense because white is never going to play twice to be able to kill that giant group. Okay, I'm showing you that here. Okay, the MEI values here are increasing. At the bottom of the tree, we have uh, 2 and negative 14, right? So that means that the average is 8 points and moves, so the, the count here is, uh, is uh, negative 6. Okay, we find this left one is, is plus 3, right? So plus 3 and negative 6 is a swing of 9, right? 2 point average, we just average directly here, and we get plus 1.5, and the value of the moves are 4.5 at the top and 8 for the second one. Well, the values are increasing down the tree, so something must be wrong. If, if a player plays at 4.5, of course the next player is going to play at 8. Of course, because you're always playing the best move on the board. So there's no possible way that this, this uh, bottom right is going to happen. Okay, the only way it would happen would be co, normally. All right, so uh, what we do is we take this possibility out. And then this, we just take this value and lift it up here and assign that to the top level. Say, all right, well, we're going to treat it as white already having sente privilege here, so they just get that move for free. So we take the, the, the value of the position after the sente play and just lift it up above to the previous one. Because we know that any time that uh, white plays this, black is going to answer with this. Okay, so the difference then is the value of the reverse sente play, which is this move. So this move is actually worth one point. So it behooves you to play the, like, the exact same length of corridor with a different follow-up. It behooves you to play the sente plays first because those are worth one point each before you play the three-quarter point corridor. And thirdly, uh, if the value stays the same, then it's not sente or gote. It's ambiguous because you have a three-point move and then it's followed up by another three-point move. So you could play that position, or you couldn't, because there might be another three-point move somewhere else. So it's not really gote and it's not really sente. So, so yes, if you have this position on the board here, this is worth three points to play here. You can uh, follow the math yourself if you like. But if you save one stone, threatening to save three more stones in the corridor is worth three points. And it's ambiguous. Your opponent could decide to play the three-point move or not. Um, okay, I want to have more time for questions, so I'm just going to flash these up in front of you. You can take these numbers and add them together to get the whole value of the board. Uh, you can compare them directly, so if one is bigger than the other, you should play the first one. Right? Um, you can save a position's result because it's not going to change if, um, if there's no other influence, and just keep that in the back of your head. And so then you can like, make a catalog of all the, all the plays on the board that are worth 1.66 points and say, okay, well, these two are MEI, you know. Um, right, we can, you can use divide and conquer methods uh, to use, for computer Go, can use these uh, weekly, and apparently I have an error. Uh, the only downside, of course, is that if there's any sort of outside global change that causes your position to change, then you have to recalculate the whole mess. So that's the biggest problem in actually using it for computer Go. Otherwise, it's very accurate and comes very close to an evaluation function for computers, similar to how chess has. Uh, and then, of course, uh, doing a tree in your head is difficult, but you could like take some paper and in the end game, you could start like, just while your opponent's thinking, just drawing out all the trees, <laughs> writing down the values and the moves, like, I know how to play this end game. Okay, and then uh, Dr. Berlekamp wrote a book about this using chilling. Uh, I encourage you to go read Mathematical Go, and he actually played 
a, uh, had two players, uh, Roy Naiwei and, and Zhang Zhuzhou, um, played two game, a, a couple games against each other where an alternative to playing a move was taking a card worth a certain number of points. And uh, so it bears out that if you look at the Nii value for each of these things, they would compare. Like, for instance, capturing five stones versus saving them or taking the five-point card is identical. Okay. Thank you very much.